The realm of crafting and survival games is a tapestry woven with diverse experiences, ranging from exceptional to downright awful. While some titles have faded in obscurity, others have left a firm mark on gaming history. Combining the fear of the dark, the fear of the ocean, and the fear of the unknown, Subnautica manages to weave survival elements, crafting, exploration, and base building together. And with all of that, and what do you get? Well, eaten most of the time. Subnautica is an open-world exploration game that was released in 2014 in early access, and quickly became one of the most well-known games of its time. Its roots spawned a bunch of YouTubers and Let's Play series, and was even followed by a less-than-stellar sequel. Maybe I'll get to that one day. In your adventure, you'll be exploring the depths of an alien ocean, filled with weird and wonderful creatures of all sizes. You'll be putting your skills to the test with survival and crafting elements, and you'll be showing off your creativity with base building mechanics. All of this is encompassed by an intriguing story of a sole survivor alone on an alien world. In this video, I'll be buckling up my Seamoth seatbelt, and we'll be diving into everything that Subnautica has to offer. We'll review all of its mechanics, and we'll deep dive into the story, and at the end, we'll ask the very simple question, is it any good? <laughs> We begin our adventure after being violently ejected from our spacecraft and thrust into the planet of 4546b. Whilst we elegantly crash into the ocean, our life pod begins to literally disintegrate and we get smacked on the head by a piece of metal, knocking us out. A good start. As we come to, we find ourselves amid fire and flames and the game gives us control of our character. Our first task is to put out the fire and begin to formulate an escape plan. But with no idea of what just happened, that's not going to be an easy feat. In its initial moments, the game teaches us about interacting with our environment and our inventory, and guides us to use our fire extinguisher to save the day. You have suffered minor head trauma. This is considered an optimal outcome. This PDA has now rebooted in emergency mode with one directive to keep you alive on an alien world. Please refer to the data bank for detailed survival advice. Good luck. Once the burning has stopped, we're free to leave the pod. Subnautica is focused around exploring your environment and piecing together the information that you'll need to progress. And a small touch that I love, when you leave your life pod for the first time, the player is treated to a lovely animation depending on which exit you choose. For example, if you decide to exit through the top of the pod, you'll witness birds flying overhead. Or if you take the water route, you'll encounter your first fish swimming idly by. It's the little touches like this that we'll see time and time again, and these are the things that really help to create a story that you'll remember. Subnautica is a pretty unique experience overall, and certainly doesn't hold the player's hand as much as you might expect. Throughout your time on Planet 4546b, you'll gently be guided and steered towards your next destination, but the absence of any quest markers or any specific goal is a really nice experience. As we disembark from our life pod, the sheer expanse of the ocean becomes evidently apparent. If we're going to get anything done here, we're going to need to go deeper. Oh, sorry, wrong game. The design of Subnautica's map is notably distinct, and it's not randomised at all. And this approach to designing a survival-based crafting game is intriguing. Rather than having randomised features every time, the developers have leveraged this to their advantage, and handcrafted a world packed with interesting and memorable locations. And as we see throughout the game, this is executed really well. The playable area of Subnautica unfolds atop a volcano crater, with diverse biomes in between. Our sudden ejection lands us in the middle of the safe shallows, which, as the name suggests, provides us with a safe haven harboring only small and harmless wildlife. However, as we venture outwards and plunge ourselves deeper into the ocean, the environment becomes increasingly perilous, and the more dangerous and larger the creatures become. That is, until later on in the game when things start to get less scary, but you'll see what I mean later. At this early stage in the game, our overall goal is unclear, so we get to work on exploring our immediate surroundings and repairing the life pod. To do that, we're going to need a repair tool, which we can craft by gathering materials. Crafting is a key gameplay loop in Subnautica. Collecting and processing materials into useful items is something you'll be doing quite often. Resources for crafting can be found nearly everywhere in the game world and come in all shapes and sizes. Metals and minerals can be found inside small rock structures, which can be bashed open with your fists. Or nearby fish and plants can be collected with a survival knife or just by picking them up. Once you've collected materials, you can process and combine them in your handy dandy fabricator, which acts like a sort of crafting bench from Minecraft. Just select the blueprint of the item you want to build and off it goes. Nice. Once we've crafted our first repair tool, we can finally get to work on repairing the pod, fixing the storage facilities, the power, and the radio, all of which will be important later on. 
Once the pod has been restored to working order, we set out to tackle the next problem on our agenda, food and water. Subnautica was released in 2014, a time when the survival genre was booming, with games like The Long Dark, Rust, The Forest, and a myriad of other titles. So at the time, Little Early Access Subnautica was just another notch on the metaphorical bedpost. Thankfully though, its survival mechanics work quite well, and serve to heighten the player's experience rather than drowning them in forced gameplay elements. Our player has four basic resources to look out for, these being food, water, oxygen, and health. And we're going to have to manage all of these while progressing through the game if we want to avoid a watery death. If you prefer to do away with all of this, you could play on freedom mode, which removes the food and water mechanics, and creative mode, which avoids death altogether. Or if you're feeling braver than I am, you could ramp it up with hardcore mode, which gives you just one life and deletes your save on death. But I'd rather keep my sanity. Food and water is easily managed, and edible resources can be extracted from the game world around you. Your main source of lunch at the very beginning of the game will likely be collecting and cooking fish. Sustaining your thirst follows a similar pattern. In early game water can be harvested from bladderfish. Just pop one of these bad boys into your fabricator, and out comes a lovely plastic bottle of water. Although, considering these guys are called bladderfish, I don't really want to think about what's inside that bottle. As we learn more blueprints and build more infrastructure later on, we'll be able to access more advanced ways of keeping ourselves alive, including the ability to build water filtration machines, and even ways to plant fruits and vegetables, which is pretty cool. Health and oxygen mechanics work slightly differently. Health can be restored through medical kits, which are crafted in the fabricator like any other item. But we can also use our medical kit fabricator, which slowly generates med kits without the need to spend resources. So we'll let that chug away silently in the background in case we need it later. Oxygen is what you'll be using to stay alive. Shocking, I know. At the start of the game, our oxygen supplies are extremely limited and only allow us to stay underwater for around 30 seconds. The main gameplay loop of Subnautica is designed to keep the player upgrading and improving their equipment to enable deeper and longer exploration trips. We'll unlock the ability to upgrade our diving gear for easier on foot or fin exploration later on. And we'll get access to vehicles which can provide their own source of oxygen, which comes in really handy. If you're feeling creative, you can even build elaborate pipe systems to deliver oxygen from the surface, like a really long snorkel. And I really like this. The developers provide the player with different ways to play the game depending on your tastes. And you can either take things slowly and build up your infrastructure as you go, or go in stasis rifle blazing and get eaten by a reaper leviathan. After some time exploring the basics, we get our first message on the radio. The radio in Subnautica is one of the most important tools in the game, and when you receive a message, you'll get a pop-up on the right side of the HUD. From time to time, our player will receive messages from other entities nearby, and these can sometimes be slightly unusual. What's that? Huh. Radio. What's going on with that radio? In the early game, we'll use this to receive messages from other survivors and crash life pods and the developers have done an excellent job of integrating this into the gameplay itself. Rather than having a boring quest journal, these radio messages serve to indicate and direct the player to important points of interest, and this is a really immersive way to combine the story and gameplay elements together. Our first message comes from LifePod3, another poor survivor who landed nearby. In this first transmission, everything is quite calm and collected. Receiving pre-recorded distress call, playing back. This is LifePod3, uploading our coordinates. We're plugging some holes in our emergency sea glide, so if we're late for the rendezvous, don't panic. Also, don't go home without us. Seriously. Three out. At this point, you're probably expecting all of the survivors to meet up and get happily whisked to safety, but this doesn't really go to plan. You'll also notice that this message introduces us to the concept of a sea glide as well, which at this point we have no recollection of, but this is a nice element of foreshadowing. After the message plays, we get some coordinates in our PDA, directing us to the location of LifePod 3. So, off we go to help. So after adventuring for a while, this is where I decide to shut the game off for the first time to take a break. Unfortunately, this is also where I learned that Subnautica doesn't have an autosave system, because apparently we live in the 1990s. So when I turn the game back on, I have to relive the experience of being smashed in the face with fire extinguishers. Considering the fact that the developers have lovingly patched and supported this game up until even the end of 2022, how hard would it have been to implement an autosave feature? Thankfully, we don't really lose too much progress, and so we get to work rebuilding our tiny base in Seamoth again. After we've done this, we receive another radio message, this time from LifePod19. This is Officer Keenan, LifePod19. The captain is gone. I have assumed command. The last thing the captain did was give me coordinates for dry land. We regroup one and a half kilometers southwest of the crash site. Stay together and good luck. This message will now repeat. Rendezvous coordinates corrupted. Transmission origin coordinates downloaded. This one is pretty interesting because rather than giving us the coordinates directly, we'll need to use the information given to us and explore a bit to find them. 
Unfortunately, this life pod is located in the deep sparse reef biome, which we're not yet able to explore because it's down 300 meters deep. So before we can visit our friends, we'll need to upgrade our Seamoth, and to do that, we stumble upon another problem. Are you seeing a pattern here or is that just me? To upgrade vehicles, we'll need to build the Moonpool base module, which we'll need to find a blueprint for. And to do that, we'll need to explore outward a bit further than we've been so far. And this is where the game really starts to show us what it has to offer. Our destination is in the Mushroom Forest, and this biome is split into two sections. One in the northwest and another in the northeast, just north of the Aurora itself. Because I'm a gigantic baby, I decided to go to the bigger northern western side, which I hoped would contain less man-eating fish. The Mushroom Biome is a sight to behold, and seeing this area for the first time both intrigued and terrified me. Spanning a depth between 75 to around 250 meters, this biome looks absolutely gorgeous with its large cliffs spanning down into unimaginable depths and weird looking fungus trees dotting the landscape. We arrive at our destination and begin scouring the area for a moonpool blueprint, but as I do so, the computer lets off a warning, and this is by far one of the most memorable voice lines in the entire game. You probably know which one I'm talking about. Detecting multiple Leviathan class life forms in the region. Are you certain? Whatever you're doing is worth it. This single voice line just sums up the whole game for me. That constant overbearing feeling of fear, awe, dread, and wonder all at the same time, constantly crashing and smashing against each other as you explore the watery depths. At the edge of the forest, we also come face to face with a sheer vertical drop, which slowly dissipates into a black, lifeless void. Now I'm a good swimmer and I'm not afraid of the ocean, but if this doesn't scream thalassophobia, then I'm not sure what does. Thankfully, we can avoid this area for now as we don't have the required upgrades to fully explore it, but we will need to come back here later on. In the distance, you'll also see another biome that I'm going to avoid for the time being, but the plant life in this region looks rather unusual, even more unusual than the mushroom trees. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I catch a glimpse of something odd. We'll get back to whatever the hell that was a little bit later on. After more exploration of the mushroom forest, some weird encounters and some brown trousers, we finally locate the blueprint for the moon pool and make our way back home. Back at base, I check my DMs, and to my surprise, while we were away, we receive another message from the Sunbeam. This is Sunbeam. You know Aurora. We're from a little transgov on the far side of Andromeda, and we have a saying there. There's no bad without the good, no good without the bad. Sounds like you tasted a bunch of the former, but that only means you're overdue a whole lot of the latter. Might just be we're in. We're scanning for somewhere to park. We'll be in touch when we find it. Sunbeam out. Maybe we will be saved after all. While waiting for our rescue from the Sunbeam, I get to work building our first moon pool, which will allow us to craft and install upgrades in our Seamoth. This is something I love about Subnautica. Rather than just having a crafting bench, we get access to an entire room to park our Seamoth into. Having the ability to park your vehicle, get out and walk around changes the Seamoth from being simply an in-game vehicle to something that I physically own, have to manage and maintain and store away. The moon pool has a number of useful features as well. Aside from simply crafting upgrades, in here we can use the customization console to change the color and the name of our Seamoth, which is a nice touch. I apply some new Go Faster stripes to the ship and install a depth module, which will allow us to travel deeper. Now that the Seamoth can dive to 300 meters, we set our sights back on finding life pod 19, and hopefully dry land. This life pod is located in a crevice in the shallow portion of the reef biome, known as the Sparse Reef, located just south of the grassy plains, so we head on over. This biome creeps the absolute hell out of me, because it's just so devoid of pretty much anything at all. In a weird way, I never really understood how claustrophobic these wide open spaces can be. Even though we've never seen anything remotely dangerous inside them, I just feel so helpless and defensive, and this is a feeling that the game captures perfectly. It's like the fear of the dark or the fear of the unknown. You know something is there, but it's so incomprehensible and out of reach that it just becomes even more terrifying. When exploring this area, the only sounds you'll be able to hear are the sounds of your Seamoth and the really unnerving ambient soundtrack which is quite unsettling to say the least. Inside Life Pod 19, as is expected, we find no survivors, but we do find another crew log from someone named Officer Keen. Interestingly, from this, we can gather that the captain actually tried to keep the ship in one piece to facilitate rescue from Altera HQ, which ultimately failed, but thankfully we were able to retrieve the coordinates for dry land given to us by Officer Keen, who's nowhere to be found. So off we go to the promised land. Fortunately, this trip isn't very long at all, and it's nice to see the developers placing these story breakrooms in a way that makes sense from a player's perspective. If you were really lucky, you might even find this location on your own before being directed here. On the way to the rendezvous location, I was getting excited. Considering all we've been able to find so far is water, terrifying chasms, and yet more water, the thought of dry land was an exciting prospect. What would we find? Would we be rescued? We arrive at the island, which is literally right above the life pod location. Surely, if this lifeboat crashed into this location, it would have landed on the island itself. Maybe it fell off. Who knows? 
The island itself seems to be floating on the surface of the ocean, and if you swim down underneath, you'll be able to see organisms attached to it, which I assume are keeping the island afloat. This is really cool to see, and while never fully explained, if you scan these floaters with your scanner, you'll get a nice data bank entry explaining what these weird creatures are. You'll even be able to find a few more of these in other locations later on, which is a nice touch of lore. After some unplanned spinning around the island trying to find an entry point, we find a beach and begin to explore, and immediately the atmosphere and ambience changes to a more mysterious and unnerving tone. It's moments like this in Subnautica when you feel like you've been rewarded for your exploration and efforts. It's like a silent, hidden quest has been completed, and now we get to explore and learn more about the world as our reward. Well, the first thing we encounter are these stupid spider crabs, which jump out at you and cause a small amount of damage. Thankfully, they don't hurt very much, but they're so annoying because of how hard they are to actually fight back against. Because they're so small, it's almost impossible to hit them. And while this is a small annoyance overall, it does bring up the issue that Subnautica's combat systems leave a lot to be desired. On the beach, we find another log from Officer Keen. The log details a conversation between Keen and another survivor, and details how they both decided to leave the safety of the island to travel to the crashed Aurora, but got intercepted by a Leviathan, and that's the last we ever hear of them. This log, as ominous as it is, gives the player a few things to think about. For example, if you weren't already planning to, this is another in-game prompt for you to go and visit the Aurora, and also it's a subtle hint informing us of the dangers that might be lurking nearby. This is another great example of subtle world building and immersive quest design. On the island itself, we have a few notable areas of interest to explore. If you look carefully, you'll be able to find three uninhabited bases, which we can investigate. Two of these bases are placed conveniently at the top of mountains on the far side of the island, and inside we can find remnants of unknown survivors, which begins a totally optional side quest. If you wanted to, you could completely ignore this plotline. The first log tells us of three survivors who arrived on the island and for a time attempted to live there, but quickly realised that without adequate building materials and tools, they're not going to live very long. The second audio log, located at the top of one of the observatories in the mountain, depicts a storm, which caused a massive damage to the base, and in the third log, the survivors decide to take their chances in the ocean, and leave the island behind, which is a brave move. Thankfully for us, we get the location of their watery destination, and the game leaves us to choose whether or not we want to follow them, or simply ignore them. The way the story of these survivors is presented is simply wonderful. By showing us the aftermath of what happened, the player is free to piece together the fate of these people in their own imagination. After uncovering each of these logs, we get to understand what already happened to these bases, and we're simply travelling through the destruction that has already occurred. And this is great storytelling technique, and solidifies the knowledge that we really are here alone on this planet. We don't get to change the events of these stories, we can only experience the aftermath of them once it's over. This island and its bases hold more than just story, however, and thankfully we can gather up some more blueprints here as well. If you use your scanner to scan the buildings, we can finally learn how to build an observatory, a multi-purpose room which we'll see in action later, and some interior grow beds to expand our base and allow us to grow some food, which we can conveniently pick from the trees here, which is very handy. Inside the main base on the middle of the island, we also encounter a mysterious purple tablet, and a data entry log nearby. This log doesn't really explain what the tablet is, and at this point you probably have no idea what to do with it. It's up to the player to find out what this tablet is for, and thankfully we won't have long until we figure it out. And so, walking directly down this hill, we make our way back into the ocean once again. This reminds me of Elder Scrolls, when you walk directly up and down the mountains. Now, before we get back to base, I want to point something out. Does anyone else agree that the beaches of Subnautica are hands down the most scariest places in the whole game? Hear me out, I'm not crazy, I promise. The beaches themselves are idyllic, lush landscapes, but the moment you go back into the water, the depths just reach so far downward that it's just awe-inspiringly terrifying. The fact that you can, on foot, jump off the beach and travel downwards 100, 200, even a thousand meters into the ocean is just so damn terrifying. This isn't the holiday that I signed up for. After that lovely incursion, we travel back to base. We check up on our radio, which has been filling up with messages again, and we get some more life pod coordinates to explore, which get marked on our map. I also decide to plant some of the fauna that we collected from our recent holiday, and plant them in our new grow beds and multi-purpose room. So after a few days, we should finally have a source of replenishable food, which is a lot easier to manage than having to fill my inventory with fish every 20 minutes. Just as I decide to finally take a trip to the Aurora, after being sidetracked many times, I get sidetracked again. This time we receive a message on the radio, and it's from the Sunbeam Captain. Aurora, we're approaching the planet now. We have a landing site for you that's... Well, it's better than the alternatives. We've sent you the coordinates. It'll take us a couple of days to align our orbit. We should be able to establish direct contact with you during that time. Then we're coming in to get you. Cross your fingers, the weather holds. And don't leave us waiting. Sunbeam out. Upon hearing this transmission, we're given precise coordinates to the landing zone, along with a ticking timer counting down to the Sunbeam's arrival. This is the one and only instance in the game where the developers have used a visible, ticking timer on the HUD, and with the prospect of my ride home looming, I prepare myself for liftoff. 
This is another good example of Subnautica's ability to immerse the player into the game world. The developers have cleverly integrated the timed quest objective to highlight the urgency of the situation in the story. While the game refrains from outright telling you where you have to go, in moments like this it's this sense of urgency and the fear of missing out that drives us to our next objective in an immersive and natural way. We as the player feel like we're actually stranded on this planet, and this might be our one and only chance for escape. We make our way to our destination, which happens to be yet another unexplored island. Although this time, as we surface our Seamoth, we catch a glimpse of a huge green alien-like structure. What the hell is that? On the island, we can see a huge cosmic base-like building with tendrils spiraling down into the ocean itself. I set up a nice picnic spot and eagerly anticipate the arrival of our heroic rescuers. And no sooner than when the timer reaches zero, which we did to a nice cutscene of the sunbeam gracefully descending into the atmosphere. And honestly, I'm surprised that they arrived at all. Unfortunately, our hopes of rescue are quickly dashed as the ship's attempted landing takes a turn for the worst. And this is where the story of Subnautica starts to change. Suddenly, the base that we encountered moments ago springs into motion and shifts into a gigantic cannon, like a transformer. Survivor, we see you. Man, I don't know how you held out down there. We broke an atmosphere and we're descending towards the landing site. Is that a building down there? What do you mean you can't identify it? Hold on, no turning back now. Positions, everyone. Touching down at 10, 9, 8. It's coming from the building? Change course, set thrusters to full. This Optimus Prime turret base thing blasts the poor sunbeam out of the sky, and I can only assume that the survivors, if there are any, suffer a similar fate to ourselves. As with all other optional events in the game, we have the choice to visit this area out of order, or even avoid coming here at all. Had we chosen to ignore the sunbeam and not meet up with them, we get a somber message on the radio after the fact, informing us of the sunbeam's demise. It's possible to find this area before this sequence of events occurs as well. And if you're smarter than I am, you could probably piece together the fate of the Sunbeam before the events unfold. Yet, regardless of our choices or foresight, we're powerless to save them, and we're simply relegated to witnessing their inevitable death. After our rescue vessel gets the Titanic treatment, I decide to explore the nearby alien structure more closely. Unfortunately, what I can only assume is a door is locked behind a wobbly green barrier, preventing access. If you explore nearby, you'll find a suspicious looking pedestal which might come in handy. We also find another strange purple tablet on the ground, similar to the one we found on the Dagasi Island. And putting two and two together, we use the tablet to unlock the door and the barrier dissolves. Once you've collected them in the world, the PDA will inform you that these purple tablets are available for crafting, and this will come in handy later on. This transition marks an exciting departure from the predominantly outdoor underwater environments that categorise the majority of the game up to this point. The prospect of delving into the mysteries of alien structures fills me with anticipation and ignites a sense of excitement as we venture into the unknown. Inside the mysterious base, we're confronted with some really unusual architecture and some unexplainable objects, and it oozes that cosmic horror charm. While exploring the structure, our computer companion tells us that scans of the architecture have failed, and this message instills a sense of confusion and intrigue in the player's mind. We find a weird green ion cube, which can be used to craft alien technologies back in the comfort of our base. And these cubes are essential for crafting tablets and can even be used for more advanced machinery later on, like super alien batteries. Delving deeper into the structure, we encounter a strange elevator. And this seems to be made out of, well, nothing. And we float down into the bowels of the base. Down here, you'll find a strange archway, which does nothing for now, but eventually its purpose will become clear. We also encounter what I assume is the control room, and inside we encounter a weird looking robot eye, which pokes us in the arm. After an examination, we're told that infected individuals aren't able to disable the weapon. And this is where we begin to understand the true nature of Subnautica's story. From this interaction, we're left to figure out the implications by ourselves, and we can deduce that there is a way off this island if we manage to disable the weapon. And to do that, we're going to need to find a way to cure ourselves of whatever infection we've incurred. To progress from this point, the game provides us with a number of locations in our PDA, referencing biomes that are significantly out of reach at this point in the game. And there's one that caught my eye, the Disease Research Facility at a depth of 800 meters. I'm going to bet my lucky penny that this is where we need to go to learn more about the infection. So now I'm really excited. We've got some hints as to where to go next, and we get a glimpse of what the game might offer in its deepest depths. 
Interestingly, the area around what I've decided to call Turret Island has an unusual amount of warpers in the water. Remember that weird teleporting creature that we saw earlier on? Well, these creatures are actually enforcers, and they can be found in large numbers around any of the alien structures in the world. They seemingly patrol the areas in search of infected individuals, with the sole purpose of eliminating the unknown bacteria. And considering that we now know that we're infected, we've just become enemy number one. These warpers have one of the most scary and annoying abilities in the entire game, and if you get too close, they'll teleport you around, and they can even pull you out of your seamoth if you're nearby, which when you're 200 meters in the ocean is pretty disgusting. After arriving back home, we park our seamoth for recharge in our moon pool, and we're greeted to another radio transmission. Welcome aboard, Captain. Playing partially translated broadcast. Nine new biological subjects designated. Hunting, analyzing, sharing subject locations with other agents. But this one scared the crap out of me. The radio transmits a message, seemingly intercepted from the warpers. We'll learn a bit more about these creatures later on, but for now my focus shifts to a task that I've been putting off. Investigating the Aurora. The first time I played Subnautica was probably around 10 years ago, and getting to the Aurora was one of the most exciting and memorable parts of the game, because it's just so cool to be able to explore a shipwreck, let alone an alien shipwreck. However, my excitement is tempered by the task of actually getting there. While the ship itself floats above the water's surface, the true obstacle lies in navigating the biomes around the crash site. We wait for daytime to arrive and hop in the Seamoth to begin our journey. To get there, we'll need to traverse the reef, the mountain biome, and the deeper sections of the mushroom forest and the crash site itself is home to the infamous Reaper Leviathan. From here, the game changes from a casual, leisurely exploration game and transitions into a terrifying, heart-pounding horror experience. It's like that point in Amnesia The Dark Descent, when you leave the first few areas and encounter the water monster. Shit really starts to get real. The crash site biome is actually home to nearly 10 Reaper Leviathans, which is terrifying to think about. Although, I read online that if you fly close to the bottom of the ocean floor, it's actually possible to avoid the Reaper's internal sonar system. I don't know if that's true or not, but we're gonna try it. So I make my way slowly, closer towards the ship, in the hopes of avoiding a watery death. On the horizon, we catch a glimpse of our first Reaper, obviously oblivious to our presence. These creatures are actually relatively small compared to some of the other predators in the game, but the Reaper is without a doubt the most terrifying and iconic monster in the entire series, and their animations are just wonderful. Navigating to the Aurora is a harrowing ordeal, compounded by the oppressive atmosphere and claustrophobic feeling of the ocean. It's ironic, the ocean is just so wide and expansive that there's literally nowhere to hide, and the game makes you feel so crushingly helpless, considering that we can't really even fight back against these creatures. After some more close encounters, we reach the chassis of the Aurora itself, and somehow I manage to avoid a Reaper that literally bumps into us. I play dead and stay still for a while, and eventually it decides to leave. And then I make a terrible mistake. Somehow, I manage to get the stupid Seamoth stuck on a small patch of land, next to the Aurora, and for the life of me, I can't figure out how to get it unstuck. Brilliant. I try my absolute best to ram it into the ocean and wiggle for dear life, but no, it's stuck here forever. I even used the console to spawn in a propulsion cannon, and I still couldn't get it off. And so now it's getting dark and I'm stuck in reaper infested waters, I'm completely without transport and I'm quickly running out of food and water. At this point, the only thing I'm able to do is literally swim on foot back to base to build another seamoth. And honestly, this sounds like a horrible idea. After procrastinating my task by admiring the sunset for a bit, I finally decide to swim back home. Unfortunately, our bad luck streak continues and I get swallowed up by a reaper faster than I can say SOS. But hey, when you die, you get to respawn at home. So we get there in the end. We build another Seamoth and take it out for a spin back to the Aurora and we venture inside. The inside of the Aurora is one of the most interesting parts of Subnautica, if you ignore these stupid crabs. Honestly, I wish these things were just removed from the game. They add nothing to the experience other than frustration. To get through the ship, we'll need to dive and duck in between flooded rooms, cut open doors with our laser cutter, and extinguish fires to progress. Thankfully, if you forget a fire extinguisher like I did, you can find a few in the ship itself. But be sparing with their usage, because if you run out, you may have to go back home. We encounter a few more tidbits of story and lore, and find various belongings and remnants of the crew, including a living space which we can freely explore. We also find more PDA entries, explaining that the Aurora's main mission was actually to create a phase gate in the solar system to enable interstellar travel, but we also learn of a secondary objective. Remember the survivors we found traces of earlier? Well, the Aurora's secondary objective was actually to locate and rescue these survivors, but the Aurora was shot down before it could get the chance. If you take the time to explore every nook and cranny of this ship, you'll be rewarded with a lot of interesting optional lore, and it makes exploration a really rewarding experience. 
We also encounter the captain's quarters, which is locked with a code, and we'll come back to this later. After more exploration, we also find a moon pool, which contains some blueprints for one of the late game vehicles, the prawn suit, which we'll build when we have the materials later on. And finally, before we leave, it's worth visiting the engine room, which can be accessed by swimming through an obstacle course of electrical wires. This reminds me of those water levels in Crash Bandicoot 3. Inside the engine room, you'll find the drive core, which is leaking radiation and contaminating the nearby area. The drive core shielding sustained internal damage during collision. Do not attempt repair without appropriate qualifications. If you explore this room and fix all the leaks, you can actually contain the radiation, and within a few days, the area around the crash site will be safe to explore without the radiation suit. So we set to work to repair the drive core so we can upgrade our swimsuit. But this entire area is completely optional and isn't strictly required to progress. The whole process of repairing the engine room is actually really immersive. Rather than the developers giving us a quest or a cutscene, we're left to find this area naturally through our own exploration, and we have to physically repair each section of damage, and you feel like you've solved the problem and achieved a solution, which is rewarding in and of itself. And after all that, we're finished on the Aurora, for the time being, but we'll need to come back later to find out what's behind the captain's door. Thankfully our excursion was in a complete waste of time, because now we have blueprints for the prawn suit, and for now we make our way back home. As we arrive home, we check our backlog of radio messages, and honestly, I think we might need a secretary at this point. While we were away, we received coordinates for LifePod 12 and LifePod 13, which are both slightly out of our depth range, so we'll need to upgrade our Seamoth to reach them. Inside the moon pool, we can build and use the vehicle upgrade console, which allows us to create more advanced upgrade modules for our vehicles. Subnautica's vehicle and upgrade systems are actually quite extensive, and allow you to kit out your ride with various modules as you unlock them. And these range from depth upgrades which let you swim deeper, to combat weapons like rocket launchers and even electrical defense systems. For now I kit the Seamoth out with another depth upgrade, and a handy sonar system which is great for the deeper, darker waters. LifePod 13 is our first destination located in the Mushroom Forest, and this is going to be one of the deepest locations that we've been so far. When travelling long distances in Subnautica, the dynamic ambient soundtrack starts to kick it up a notch, and when you start to go faster, you'll hear some really cool techno upbeat vibes, which contrast really well to the more ambient, slower paced music that you'll hear when crawling along the ocean floor. Although if you're anything like me, you'll have to hear this wonderful soundtrack, accompanied by the sound of me crashing into fish and splattering them all over the place every 5 seconds. You can't win them all, I guess. After a pretty awesome travel sequence, we arrive at LifePod 13 in the depths of the Mushroom Forest, and we find another databank, this one detailing a man named Joki Kassar. This guy was aboard the Aurora as an emissary in search of the Degassi survivors, the ones we encountered on the island earlier. If you take the time to explore the Aurora, you can even find some more backstory relating to this guy, which is cool. Even though this is a character that you'll never hear of ever again, he has some background lore that the player can flesh out if they're diligent enough. In the final message left by the Kassar, he details his acceptance of his inevitable death, and after this we can only assume that he's been eaten by whatever is lurking around outside. It's moments like this in the game that make you feel constantly on edge. You never feel like you're safe. Nearby, I also come across another weird point of interest. If you look closely, you can see this big mushroom tree and a piece of the aurora which must have dropped on top. Seeing this, naturally I had to go and explore it, and I'm glad I did because this wreck holds quite a few useful blueprints. This is another illustration of how Subnautica draws its player into the world, and compels them to explore. By placing this wreck in an unexpected and interesting location, we as players are silently coerced into investigating further, and by doing so we get rewarded with useful blueprints. In this case we find a really important upgrade for a vehicle that we've not yet built, a thermal upgrade module for the Cyclops. This is a really important upgrade which will allow us to charge our vehicle from thermal vents in the world, and avoids us having to recharge the batteries, which comes in really useful later on. Next on the itinerary is LifePod 12, and this is located in an area that never fails to scare the crap out of me. To get to LifePod 13, we'll need to go into the Bulb Zone, which is as horrible as it sounds. Darkness envelops us as we travel down, making this area dark as shit, but not only that, the sheer vastness of this area triggers that familiar claustrophobic feeling, and makes you feel exposed from every angle. Using the sonar to navigate this area helps quite a bit, but this also just highlights the huge open space even more. Despite the trepidation, the Bulb Zone offers some rare and useful resources for those brave enough to explore its depths. So it's worth checking this area out if you need some crafting materials. And fun fact, this region was actually known as the Kush Zone in Early Access Development, but was later renamed to the Bulb Zone, supposedly to avoid copyright. 
After a bit of Google foo, the only reference I was able to find was these weird balls. Let me know in the comments if I'm going crazy, but I've never seen these things in my life. Anyway, after some koosh weirdness, we arrive at LifePod 12, and it's no wonder that this guy didn't last very long. Day and night in this region are essentially meaningless, and this life pod is positioned precariously between electrified behemoths and erupting lava geysers. I think we got a little bit more lucky with the safe shallows. Amidst the dangers, if you look up to the surface, you can still see some of the light shining down into the water, reminding us of the sheer vastness of Subnautica's underwater world. This is also one of the areas that changes in tone and atmosphere while you're down here. The music and sounds of the creatures will start to morph, and the subtle change really makes each and every biome start to feel unique. Inside the life pod, we find another voice log, and as is tradition, this one is pretty important. It details a doctor who sounds like he's going mad, which is probably a fair reaction at this point. I'm uh, not really a doctor. I know that's what my ID says, but I never have been. Cheated the medical exams. What does a doctor these days need to know about manually resetting bones? When was the last time a top surgeon actually cut someone open? That's what the robots are for. Doctors these days read diagnoses off of computer readouts. For that, I'm perfectly qualified. But what good is it when I'm not connected to the main network? I'm bleeding. I've got glowing green pustules growing on my hands. I run a self-scan and it tells me I've got skin irritation. The only thing I studied in medical school was how to lie convincingly. What the hell do I know about how to treat an alien disease? I'm actually going to die down here. This is another immersive hint from the developers, telling us that we should probably do a self-scan if we haven't already. So I take my wetsuit off and inspect my hands, which seem to be fine, but the scan says that we're definitely infected. Not wanting to stay in the bulb zone for any longer, I make my way back home and prepare to go even deeper. From here, Subnautica starts to venture away from the more guided storytelling, an on-rails experience that we've had so far. And from this point onwards, a lot of the progress that you'll make is reliant on your own ability to read and piece together what you've learned so far. In that respect, it's very similar to other immersive exploration games like The Outer Wilds, which by the way is on my list to cover at some point. I've been itching to try that game out for years. For us to go any deeper, we're going to need to get some serious upgrades. And if you've been paying attention, you'll remember that back in the Aurora we found blueprints for the prawn suit, and in the Mushroom Forest we found some for the Cyclops. Well now we're going to need to build them, and unfortunately for us, building the Cyclops is easier said than done. Most items and vehicles in the game require just one blueprint, but the Cyclops requires three in total, and quite a few resources, so I set out to work mining and crafting, and eventually we get it built. Subnautica is a game where the premise changes throughout, depending on where you are in the story. Building the Cyclops is another one of those pivotal moments, and it's such a huge upgrade from the Seamoth, and you can even build and move around inside it. Once you've built the Cyclops, you're able to visit nearly every single location in the game, and effectively allows you to build a giant mobile base, which is awesome. I waste no time kitting out the Cyclops with a few modules, including a thermal reactor, which we found the blueprint for earlier, some missiles, a sonar system, and even an electrified shield, which makes me feel somewhat safe. I also take the time to build some infrastructure inside the Cyclops itself, including battery chargers, a radio, a fabricator, storage, and even some grow beds for food. This took a really long time, and all I can say is that I hope nothing destroys this thing, because I will literally just quit on the spot. We also set to work on constructing the prawn suit, but sadly the Cyclops can only hold one vehicle at a time, so for now it's going to stay at home. The only problem I've got with the Cyclops, aside from the fact that it's slower than a dead snail, is the fact that it's really hard to navigate shallow waters and small spaces. While driving around, I've crashed into things behind me more than I can count, and it gets really annoying when driving close to the ocean floor, so I need to make a constant effort to make sure that this thing doesn't share a similar fate to our other Seamoth. Although I have to say, traveling in the Cyclops is just so immersive. It's so much fun getting in, walking up the stairs into the captain bay and taking control of the ship. It's kitted out with touchscreen controls and toggles as well, so driving this thing really adds to the immersion. And the internal voice of the Cyclops is just the best voice ever. Seriously, if I had to choose between the boring voice of the Altera PDA and this, the Cyclops wins hands down every time. Welcome aboard, Captain. All systems online. Equipped with some more vehicles at our disposal, I turn my eye to our next objective, locating the Degasi survivors. Remember on the mountain island, we found coordinates to their next destination. Well, that's where we're heading now. Nested inside the grassy plains, you'll find the entrance to the Jelly Shroom Caves, a location that was referenced by one of the life pod survivors earlier. As is luck. It's the day of the crash. I don't know what the heck is happening. I'm scared and I'm not going outside. There are shadows in the water under the hatch, but I can't tell if they're rocks or aliens. And there's weird looking caves nearby. Now that we have the means, exploring this area is an exciting prospect. Not only because we get to explore uncharted territory, but also because of the sheer vertical drop through its intricate tunnel entrance. 
To get down here, we'll need to abandon the Cyclops and use our smaller Seamoth. And as we emerge through the tunnels, we're greeted to a breathtaking transformation of the environment, and the dull blue hues give way to a vibrant, psychedelic ambience. It's moments like this that will stay with you long after finishing your playthrough of the game, because when you look back, you'll remember these lush environments and the feeling of unparalleled exploration. This side story and all of its unique and interesting areas are completely optional if you decide not to follow the storyline, or if you somehow didn't pay attention. While the primary attraction of the Jelly Shroom Caves is the gassy base itself, the environment poses a number of hazards for the unprepared, and I end up dying a few times. Parking the Seamoth nearby for quick access to oxygen, we leave our vehicle and cautiously navigate through the flooded, abandoned base for more clues about the Degasi. The base in the surrounding biome is full of poisonous, dangly things, and that's the technical term, and these will kill you really quickly if you're not paying attention, so you need to move slowly and carefully through this area. Inside the Degasi base, we uncover several intriguing discoveries, one of which is a blueprint for the water filtration machine, which is a welcome relief from having to catch and eat bladderfish for water. The filtration machine is actually a really useful addition to any base, and can be used to passively generate both water and salt, so it's really handy. Another really nice touch that I love here, inside this base you'll find an enhanced oxygen tank, which has a much larger capacity than the one that we're currently using, and this blueprint is placed so well here. It's this thoughtful touch from the developers, and they knew that getting down here and exploring this base was a difficult task. And by leaving this blueprint here, they've acknowledged and rewarded the player for overcoming this challenge, and this is a nice risk-reward dynamic. More importantly, we also stumble upon another PDA entry, containing vital information regarding the fate of the Degasi. From the information left behind on the original island, we gathered that they moved their base to avoid the harsh weather outside, but didn't really have much luck down here either. The log states that the survivors found something deep in the ocean, beyond the depths that we've been able to explore until now and they speculate that this finding might hold the key to neutralising whatever it was that blew their ship out of the sky, which we now know to be the turret base that shot down the sunbeam. The survivors pursue this information and embark to their final destination into the abyss, which we're also now compelled to follow. Down underneath the floating island we discovered earlier lies the Grand Reef Biome, and this place is absolutely one of the most oppressive locations in the entire game. This area is home to creatures that we've not yet encountered before, including the Crab Squid and the Ghost Leviathan, which we'll discuss later on. Getting down here is a task in and of itself, because this biome is located deep at over 500 meters in the ocean, and it's dark as hell down here, so make sure you're equipped before venturing downwards. Deep at the bottom of one of the caverns, we encounter the final Degasi base, and it's no wonder they didn't last long down here. The area itself is absolutely crawling with dangerous crab squids, and these guys attack on sight, so you'll need some stealthy movements to get inside the base. These weird entities boast gigantic brains and crab-like legs, and they're highly aggressive. They absolutely hate light, so try and avoid shining your torch on them, or you'll get a taste of their EMP blast. Inside the base itself, we uncover some useful artifacts, including an upgrade to our diving equipment and even a coffee machine. This harrowing journey was all worth it for some caffeine. I really hate how these crab squids just appear menacingly in the windows of the base, and up close, these guys are absolutely disgusting. While trying to avoid these horrible creatures, we uncover another PDA entry which details the fate of the Degasi survivors. Please, stop fighting and listen. We're sick. What? How? You've been coughing, right? Feeling itchy? Blisters? Yeah. The biometrics would have warned us if we were sick. It's something new. It's not in the database. Come on, then. What's it gonna do? Turn us inside out? Dissolve us into jelly? It's an alien bacteria. It's everywhere. Every organism on this planet. It's altering our genetic code. Uh, how are the creatures surviving if they're infected? I don't know yet. Want me to cut some of them open for you? Find out what makes them tick? No. Just tell me what you need, son. Materials. Equipment. Just... Can I have some quiet? I need some time to think. After hearing this, we can assume that these survivors have also been infected. And after this, the survivor's story begins to go awry. For more exploration of the area, we uncover some more logs and lore. It seems that one of the survivors, Marjorie, brought back a Reaper Leviathan for the other one to study, and this caused some disruption to the small colony, as you can imagine. The survivors begin to argue, and amidst the chaos, they get attacked by the same Leviathan, described by one of the survivors as an alien Kraken, which I can assume is the Reaper. Which just makes you think, if these Reapers exist 500 meters above the ocean near the Aurora, how the hell did this survivor managed to capture and bring this leviathan back to base. 
The survivor details how their base was attacked and ripped open by this same creature and ultimately caused the death of two out of three of the survivors. After this, the remaining survivor eventually manages to get back to the surface and his final log details his eventual demise, presumably due to the infection. And after all that, it's safe to say that these guys suffered a much worse fate than ourselves. And now this abandoned base is essentially a graveyard. And that's the last we ever hear about the Degassi survivors. But I suppose now they're not survivors at all. Now that we've exhausted our knowledge of the Degassi survivors, it's time to get some real answers. And for that, we're going to need to dive deeper than we've ever been before. After reaching this point in the story, I was intrigued to see what was coming next. But I was also pretty terrified to see what horrors lie in store below. If you recall, earlier on the Degassi Island, we found a PDA journal with some rough locations to other alien bases. Well, now it's time for us to follow these directions and visit the disease research facility nested deep down in the Lost River. To reach the Lost River, our path takes us through the dunes and into the Blood Kelp Forest. And this is another biome that we've seen, but not really been through yet. This biome admittedly is a lot more menacing than its counterpart Kelp Forest, and a deep sense of unease begins to take hold. The forest is split into two distinct biomes, the southern trench area and a northern section, which is a lot more dangerous. Due to the narrow corridors of the trench, I opt for the northern area as it's a lot easier for the Cyclops to navigate. The northern Blood Kelp Zone is one of the more dangerous regions of the game, and its wide open areas are patrolled by a new Leviathan that we've not yet encountered. The Ghost Leviathan, another fishy adversary that we'll need to contend with in the forest, and this location contains just one adult, but considering their size, one is more than enough. Close encounters with these creatures is terrifying and they'll kill you pretty quickly if you're in a sea moth or on foot and they'll let off a blood curdling scream when they attack or if they're nearby, which is unnerving. When inside the Cyclops, the Ghost Leviathan will attempt to roll the submarine over, almost as if it's a toy. And if this happens and you're unlucky enough to be walking around the ship, it's pretty much an instant death. As terrifying as these creatures are, I still think the smaller, less dangerous Reaper Leviathan is still my favorite, or technically least favorite creature, just because of how iconic they are. And there's also one other thing to note here. The location of Subnautica, as I said earlier, exists on top of a crater with a mysterious infinite void in all directions if you stray too far. If you're unlucky enough to get caught in this void somehow, the game will constantly and relentlessly spawn ghost leviathans at you until either you leave the void and go back to the main map, or they kill you. And trust me, you do not want to be in this void. I try and avoid these creatures entirely, and slowly but surely we make our way through the Blood Kelp Forest and into the Lost River. The Lost River stands as one of the most expansive and deepest biomes in the whole game and extends below the surface of some of the biomes we've already explored. Navigating the Cyclops down here is a bit of a challenge, especially if you make a wrong turn. And it's also dark as shit, so this is where the new sonar module we install comes in really handy. The only problem is that the sonar tends to drain the batteries really quickly, so you've got to make sure to have some batteries charging in our battery pods when we travel around. It's the little touches like this that make you feel like you're going on a long and arduous journey, and it's one of the reasons why Subnautica is such an immersive experience. You're never actually sure what you're going to encounter in each of these areas, so being prepared for every eventuality is important. After some more crashing and terrible three-point turns, we finally arrive at our destination. Terrain scans indicate this biome contains unusually high concentrations of organic and fossilized remains. Well, that's not unnerving at all. This area is such a stark contrast to the other locations that we've been through. Situated so far down in the ocean depths, the Lost River even has its own ecosystem, complete with winding rivers and cascading waterfalls, and it's such a joy to explore. Eventually, we come across an unusual structure in the distance and move closer in the sea moth to take a look. This sublocation of the Lost River is known as the Bone Fields, and as the name suggests, contains a lot of, well, bones. While we prepare to disembark the Cyclops, we get another transmission from the Warpers, but this time it's completely untranslatable. And if this is another attempt at unnerving me, well, well done game, because it worked. Exploring the unusual structure nearby, it dawns on me that this is a ribcage of an old fossilized leviathan that must have perished long ago. The environmental storytelling in this location is commendable, and it just makes you think about how gargantuan this creature must have been when it was still alive. It's questions like this that constantly keep you on your toes when exploring, and you'll always find something new and interesting to drive you forward. If you follow the fossil, you'll eventually find its head, and this huge entity serves as a great place to park the Cyclops. After the detour, we finally arrive at our next destination, the Disease Research Facility. 
deep underwater at 800 meters below the surface. The facility itself is massive and anchored on rocks with giant alien-like chain structures, similar to the turret island base we saw earlier. The allure of this location is quickly overshadowed by the presence of river prowlers, which have replaced the pesky sand sharks from the shallow biomes. Eventually we find the entrance to the facility, but unfortunately it's been flooded and abandoned, which leads us to ask the question, what the hell happened here? Navigating around the research facility is more difficult than the other base, considering that this one is completely submerged, but you can squeeze the seamoth in if you try hard enough. Inside we encounter some more lore and learn that the disease that we've been infected with is known as the Kara Contagion, which was brought to the planet for further analysis, after an outbreak which caused the death of over 140 billion life forms in the solar system. Further information also suggests that the symptoms include odd green skin lesions, which ties back to what one of the survivors mentioned earlier on. The computer suggests again that we perform a self-scan, and sure enough, we've got the same symptoms. We also manage to come across the remains of a warper and learn more about its history. Our PDA reveals that these creatures were biomechanically constructed by the same people who erected these facilities and were being used to eliminate the traces of the Kara virus, which is why they've been chasing us and sending us hate mail. They're trying to eradicate the virus and us along with it. Further exploration also reveals the fate of the research facility itself. After being attacked and literally pushed off a cliff by an unknown leviathan, the facility fell deep into the Lost River and was destroyed. And all of this is technically optional but very important lore, and these subtle intricacies are entirely missable if the player doesn't take the time to thoroughly explore their environment, which is pretty cool. With the remains of the disease research facility explored, we find another breadcrumb telling us that a second facility was built underwater at 1400 meters, and this was used to study the Sea Emperor Leviathan, which might be immune to the disease. Although the data also suggests that this creature has probably escaped by now, which isn't ominous at all. Upon leaving the facility, things get spooky again, and we get attacked by another Leviathan, a juvenile version of the ghost Leviathan we encountered earlier. These creatures are considerably smaller than their adult counterparts and live in the Lost River, but they still pack quite a punch and still make horrendous sounds. Thankfully, playing dead seems to work and they will eventually leave you alone. And by eventually, I mean that I had to sit here for about 20 minutes before this guy finally fucked off. I'm honestly not sure as to why the developers decided to populate the Lost River with the baby versions of the Ghost Leviathan, because the adult versions are obviously more imposing and scary, but you'll see the babies after encountering the adult for the first time, so it would make sense from a progression point to encounter the adult in the Lost River. For me, this is where Subnautica starts to lose some of its charm and immersion, and by now these enemies pose little threat. The scariest part of the game by far is the beginning and the middle sections when you're exploring the upper regions of the map and the crash zone. The mid to end game of Subnautica is still a great experience, don't get me wrong, but overall, the atmosphere changes from subtle horror to more walking simulator. Eventually the baby leviathan decides to attack and our gravity missiles give it a bit of a spin and then we run off. Our next destination, as foretold by the PDA, is a thermal base located below the Lost River, and this is the penultimate destination in the game. We travel past this awesome site of a huge tree, and the colours of the biome change from that sickly green to a nice blue hue. Behind this tree is the entrance to the inactive lava zone, and inside lies the thermal plant facility. The inactive lava zone is a large, open biome located 900 meters in the ocean, and to properly explore this area we'll need the prawn suit, because the seamoth isn't capable of exploring these depths, even with the maximum depth module installed. This zone is pretty tricky to navigate for a few reasons. Firstly, the ocean floor is hot, and it'll burn you if you're not prepared, and the general temperature of this region can hit between 50 to 70 degrees Celsius, so it's worth investing in a reinforced diving suit before coming here. Not only that, but we'll also need to deal with these pesky heat leeches as well, which latch onto the cyclops and cause damage over time. To get rid of these guys, you'll need to manually leave your ship, which is terrifying in and of itself, and then hack away at them until they fall off. And not only that, but we come face to face with the biggest, most dangerous creature in the entire game, the Sea Dragon Leviathan. The Sea Dragon is the biggest and strongest aggressive enemy in the entire game, and it'll tear you to shreds if you get close. And it can even breathe fire, which is great. These guys are massive and they look pretty scary, but again, due to the fact that they barely have any animations, I still hold the Reaper as the scariest Leviathan in the game. Although they do make some pretty terrifying sounds from time to time, which makes navigation tense. We get attacked by a Sea Dragon and its damage causes a fire to erupt on our Cyclops, which is really cool. At this point in the game, the general gameplay changes from exploration of the world and the environment to more manage your cyclops simulator. When a fire breaks out on board, the music shifts to a more upbeat action melody, alarms start to blare, and the whole atmosphere changes to hot burning hues, which is really immersive.
Thankfully, our ship already has a fire extinguisher on board because again, I didn't bring one. And then we save the day. Slap bang in the middle of the biome, we come across the lava castle, a fiery maze of magma that we'll need to explore in the prawn suit because the cyclops would never fit in here. The prawn suit isn't my favorite vehicle in the game, simply because it just feels so clunky to pilot. Turning the vehicle takes a second or so and your actions feel slightly delayed, but I'm pretty sure this is by design because every other vehicle controls really well. Thankfully, a lot of the final areas in the game seem specifically built to be explored with the prawn suit, and their environments feature a lot of cliffs and chasms, so we won't really need to travel anywhere but the ocean floor. The lava maze is really easy to get lost in, so make sure you bring some food and water. Eventually, we find our way to our next alien structure, hidden in the middle of the castle. Inside the facility, we find a few points of interest, including another locked door which requires the use of another purple tablet. Thankfully, I bought a few of these with me. Behind the door is another tablet, but this time it's blue. I'm assuming we're going to need this at some point. Collecting this new blue tablet allows us the ability to craft them as well, which requires some advanced crafting materials. In the bowels of the plant, we also come across another unusual structure, like the one we saw at the start of the game. This time though, we're prompted to spend an ion crystal to power it up and lo and behold, the structure comes to life. These structures are actually teleportation devices and exist in quite a few locations across the game, and they require ion cubes to power. Once you've powered up the teleporter, we can use it to travel long distances in a pinch, and you can even take the prawn suit for it, which is handy. The only problem I've got with this is that every time I use the teleporter, my prawn suit mysteriously gets jammed inside the floor and becomes completely useless. Even if we enter the suit and try and dislodge it, we'll get stuck forever, and this bug seems to replicate itself every single time I enter a teleporter. So I don't know what's going on here. Unfortunately, this is the first example of quite a few bugs that we experience from this point in the game to the end, and it really starts to lessen the experience, which is a real shame. We're also interrupted rudely by another vision, similar to the one we experienced really early on. This time a mysterious female entity takes control of our mind, and I don't really understand yet what's happening, but rest assured, because all will be revealed soon enough. The thermal plant is actually what it says on the tin, and hosts a large thermal generator which powers all of the other structures on the island. From a gameplay perspective, there's not really that much else of interest here, so we set our sights on our final destination, the primary containment facility at over 1,400 meters deep. Getting to this destination is easy, as it's a straight route downwards from the thermal plant, although this area is heavily guarded by sea dragons, and they require some careful scooting past. We arrive at the front door, and while exiting the cyclops, I glitch through the floor and float off into the void, which isn't ideal. This bug happens if you park the vehicle close enough to the floor to go through it when you get out, so make sure there's enough room or you'll end up having to reload the game again, like I did. Although, weirdly enough, after reloading, the environment glitched out and the deep red hues of the lava disappeared and left me with weird dark black textures, which didn't really look that bad, but it's definitely bugged out, and this just stayed here like this until the end of the game, so I have no idea what happened. The primary containment facility is locked with a blue panel, which we can unlock using the blue tablet we found earlier. Inside, the facility comes to life as we walk up the steps and we're greeted to a huge room with many doors, and don't forget about the crabs. This time they've been upgraded into robot versions, which is brilliant. Inside the facility, we find some important story points and things slowly start to become clear. We encounter a large container of water, and inside a huge monolithic creature who reveals itself as the Sea Emperor Leviathan. Are you here to play? And it turns out that this is the creature that's been sending us telepathic messages throughout the game. This creature is non-aggressive and she asks for our help. We are curious whether you swim with the current or fight against it as they did. This aquarium is one of the more annoying locations in the game, and it's absolutely a pain in the ass to try and get back out of it, so if you do bring a vehicle here, be prepared for it to be stuck here forever. Even when trying to leave on foot, this resulted in my unexpected death, so I had to reload the game yet again. Down in the bottom of the aquarium, the sea dragon informs us that she and her babies have been trapped here by whoever built this place, and she wants us to help her free them. To do so, she asks us to power up the nearby teleporter, and with a puff of smoke, clears the rubble away. Although while doing this, the dragon lets off an awful, unexpected roar, and I think I nearly shit myself. I will give you freedom the others tried in vain to take. Don't do that to me, game. After powering up the nearby teleporter, the dragon rewards us with a recipe for hatching enzyme, and asks that we craft them to help the babies hatch. This is one of the final story tasks of the game, and to make this liquid, we're gonna need to explore and visit some biomes to collect rare resources. 
Fortunately for us, these biomes can be accessed through teleportation arcs, similar to the ones that we've already seen, and they're located in this facility behind the numerous doors that we found earlier on. So getting these ingredients isn't that much of a pain in the arse as it sounds. And this useful discovery also allows us to quick access nearly every single location in the game as well, so transportation beyond this point becomes trivial. I visit each and every biome, collect every ingredient, and I'm left with one final item to collect. The Sea Crown, which can be found deep inside a hole in the Sea Emperor's prison. After finally collecting all of these ingredients, we craft the enzymes and help the babies escape. These little guys swim off happily, and from this point onwards you'll start to see them populate different areas of the game, and this is pretty cool. After succeeding in her final bid to save her babies, the Emperor bids us a farewell and dies on the spot. And with that we're left with one final discovery. After hatching and leaving their prison, the babies leave behind an orange substance known as Enzyme 42. This strange liquid is actually a vaccine for the Kara virus that we've been infected with, and when we touch one of these blobs, we get completely cured. Self-scan complete. Vital signs normal. No remaining sign of bacterial infection. Putting two and two together, I eventually realised that now we're not infected, so we should be able to disable the quarantine turret and hopefully leave the island. But how the hell are we going to leave? Well, if you remember the captain's quarters from inside the Aurora way back when, we were given a code to this location a while ago, and this gets delivered via a radio message, but only after you've been to the Aurora at least once. So we travel back through the crash site and into the Aurora, and we input the code for the captain's room, and inside reveals a blueprint for a rocket, which we can now build to get us off the planet for good. And so we're left with one final task. The construction of this rocket is actually a cool experience. To build the vehicle, we'll first need to build the launch platform, and slowly piece together the parts of the rocket, crafted from expensive recipes. I don't really mind doing this myself, but I can imagine that this final crafting quest might not be for everyone. It's basically a giant resource sink, and kind of feels like the game has been delayed arbitrarily from ending. But at the same time, it's nice to know that you've worked hard for your reward. After a good bit of collecting materials and crafting parts, we construct the platform. The gantry, the boosters, the fuel reserves, and the cockpit. And after all of that, we ascend the elevator and prepare for takeoff. Inside, we're required to manually switch on each component. And once the rocket is powered up, we get offered to make a time capsule. This contraption essentially allows us to send a small capsule to other players, and reminds me a lot of the metagame from Dark Souls, with those messages between players. Inside the capsule, we can leave useful items for other players, and we get the choice to leave a message and a screenshot if we choose. These are then added to a bank of capsules, which then get seeded into the world generation. And this is actually a really cool metagame feature that didn't really need to be added, and I like the fact that the developers added this as an optional nice touch. And finally, after many days and deaths and tribulations on the planet of 4546B, we hit the launch button and... Cannot launch rocket while quarantine. Enforcement platform is still active. Oh, yeah, I forgot to turn off the turret. We visit the quarantine enforcement platform one more time to switch the turret off. And this time the robot scans us and allows us to interact with the control panel. This is a nice pre-ending to Subnautica, because to me, it almost feels like we're wrapping things up and turning off the lights to our old house before moving on. It's a really nice and thematic way to end the adventure. Finally, we say goodbye to our base, the Aurora, and the Sea Emperor, and we lift off into space. Ironically, the game ends in the same way it began, and for the last time, we lovingly get smashed in the face by space debris, and the rocket begins to orbit the planet. <coughs> Cheers, game. So I hope you enjoyed exploring and experiencing Subnautica alongside me. After all of that, I've got to say, it's probably one of the most immersive and engaging experiences I've had in a long time. Subnautica offers outstanding quality and depth, and manages to captivate, intrigue, and scare the player, and sometimes simultaneously. The sheer expansiveness of the game, its crafting elements, and its story all line up perfectly to create an unforgettable experience, and I really recommend you play this game if you haven't already. For me, the beginning of the game is the most enjoyable, and sadly the end of the game drops off a bit in terms of quality, somewhat due to the uninspiring endgame enemies, and the amounts of bugs that I experienced near the end. But I would still rate Subnautica as an absolute must play, and one of the most immersive games ever released. I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. If you did, please remember to hit that like button, leave me a comment letting me know what you think of Subnautica, and subscribe for more content like this in the future. Until next time. What is a wave without the ocean? A beginning without an end. They are different, but they go together. Now you go among the stars, and I fall among the sand. We are different. 
But we go together.